Isn't it nice to have the choir back? Thank you guys. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Joshua, <clears throat> Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. If you're able at home or in the room, would you please stand with me? And um, you pull out the book in front of you. There's a, a pew Bible there. You'll find the text on page 168. I'd love for you to do that because then you'll be able to follow along as we discuss the text a little bit later on. Joshua chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 9. When we're done reading, I'll say this is the word of the Lord so that if you believe it, you can say thanks be to God. Listen carefully. We're reading God's holy word. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you, to so be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall be successful. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord lasts forever. Please be seated. I first discovered this text as a sophomore in college at a time of great promise in my life. You know, promise, like the old people say, uh, you have, you're such a promising young man. You're such a promising young woman. I felt that at that time, it's as though the universe had put a yellow sign in front of me that said, caution, bright future ahead. And these words in verse three just jumped out at me. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you as I promised to Moses. My, my life felt in that moment promising, not because everything was easy. As a sophomore in college, I was kind of trying to stumble out of the party scene. I had not been doing well in my chosen sport, which was rowing. I'd actually had five surgeries. And, and with the loss of rowing came a kind of a, a, a catastrophic loss of identity. I was a rower and now I can't row. Who am I? No, not promising because everything was easy, but promising because God had made a great promise to me in Jesus Christ. And I was just waking up to this fact. I was learning that with Jesus... My past was my past. And, and together we could step past the past into a new future marked by his promise. Every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I promised to Moses. You see, when you walk with Jesus, you step into a new life. See, Joshua in this moment has come to the edge of the wilderness, just like us. It's a moment of great promise in his life. Promising, not because everything is easy. Remember Joshua, he was born into slavery. He lived his, most of his life in the wilderness. And as for the future, well, he's already been there. 
He was one of the 12 spies, remember? He's gone into the promised land and seen fortified cities and the people who live there are warrior people and they're the size of giants that make us feel like grasshoppers. Now, not easy, but promising because God is making him a great promise and inviting him to step into to place the the sole of his foot upon a new life. So who who is Joshua? Well, uh, do you mean who he was or who he's becoming? Because he's a bit of a moving target, isn't he? Well, we know who he was. He's always Joshua, son of Nun, which is N-U-N. I guess that was his father's name. Otherwise, it's super confusing. Joshua, son of Nun, he's always called. Moses' assistant. Do you see that in verse 1? He's he's Moses' assistant. He's not the servant of the Lord. That's, That's Moses. Moses is introduced as a servant of the Lord consistently through this literature. And consistently through this literature... Joshua is introduced as Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' his assistant. He's a number two guy. Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and here, an assistant. But if you ask, who is he becoming? This is intriguing. Turn to the end of Joshua, just chapter 24, verse 29. Somebody has added a line here that's quite provocative. In verse 29, we read, after these things, Joshua, the son of Nun, oh yeah, okay, this guy, the servant of the Lord. The man who was an assistant to the servant is now the servant. He died being 110 years old. He had a good run. And he's changed. He's experienced transformation. That's what the text is telling us there. He has indeed walked in the newness of life. And so we ask ourselves, well, how does this happen? How does a promise in the wilderness become a new way to walk? How does Joshua put his past in his past and step into a new way of life? Remember, we've been saying in this series, who you will be on the other side of the wilderness depends on what you do inside the wilderness. And so what I want to do today is I want to take us back to the desert cardio. This is a concept we learned from Moses in Deuteronomy uh, 8 just last week. If you didn't hear last week's message, um, you can go back and listen to it. But you see, the wilderness is oftentimes this place where we get stuck in a cycle. You know how they define insanity. Insanity is trying to do the same thing, expect different results, right? We know that kind of a cycle and we get stuck in cycles in the wilderness. But the desert cardio is actually a new kind of cycle that breaks us out of cycles that drives growth in grace. Now, last week, Moses describes this desert cardio. This week, Joshua applies the desert cardio. So I'm gonna walk through this again, okay? Joshua practices the desert cardio. Of course, he would learn this from Moses in the wilderness. He's Moses' assistant. Uh, But it's going to become in his life an ongoing practice that he will carry into the land of promise anytime he experiences some kind of a wilderness experience. It's a practice. It's a a cycle. So I want to walk through this cycle a couple times with you today. First of all, the cycle starts with an experience of grace. We said this. This is at the top of the diagram. He comes to this point standing in grace, Joshua already. Do you know what his name means? His name means uh, the Lord saves. And, and Moses has had changed Joshua's name. That wasn't originally his name. Moses changes his name, lays hands on him. And so uh, Joshua is already secure in grace. He's been saved by grace. He's, he's secure in grace. He knows that God has rescued him. Uh, But the focus here now in Joshua chapter 1 is on crisis. And he is in crisis. And and the writer wants us to know right away, Moses is dead. That's the crisis. Moses is dead. Now, here we find him mourning. Just as we had found Moses not long prior to this, mourning at the death of his sister Miriam. Moses is dead. This is Joshua's closest friend. 
spiritual mentor. He's grieving. This is crisis, right? He's grieving. And it's not just a personal crisis. There's a sociological dimension to this as well because we ask, well, who is Moses? Moses was the guy who holds this people together. He he spoke with God. He led the way. He parted the seas. And now Moses is dead. Joshua faces a crisis. But then we move around the cycle. There's a word. Okay, grace, crisis, third word. The Lord speaks. The Lord starts speaking to Joshua. It's a surprise. In the same way that the Lord had spoken to Moses. Now the Lord is, has a word for Joshua. And, and it's an audible word apparently in this. But it's not just an audible word. There's going to be a written word as well. There's a book through which the Lord promises always to be speaking to God's people. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, verse 8 tells us. By the way, it should not depart from your mouth because uh, ancient people, they didn't tend to read quietly. They actually read out loud and they would read the scriptures out loud and they would recite the scriptures and they would oftentimes even sing the scriptures and they would meditate on it. This is how Joshua is to know what story he's in. Your crisis is not the story. This is not a story of your fears. This is not the story of your disordered desires. You are to be rooted in God's story. This is a new story. When we step back from the Bible in our era, we see this wonderful arc to it. It's a drama in four acts, creation, fall, redemption, completion. This is God's story. The God who made all, loves all, and renews all. Hear the word. That's the third step in the cardio uh, cycle. And then the fourth step is, is, is to step out onto a promise from that word in faith pull out a promise, hear a a specific promise that relates to your situation and step out onto it. Every place, the Lord says, that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you as I promised to Moses. But the sole of your foot must first tread upon the place for you to walk in newness of life. When Joshua talks to the Lord about this crisis and hears this new word, He's going to hear the Lord say, you know what? The past wasn't shaped by Moses. It was shaped by my promise to Moses. And now the promise that I made to Moses is a promise that I make to you. You have the same promise and you are with the same God. Be strong. Be bold and courageous. Step out onto this promise. It's interesting, if you look at Joshua 3 that comes up when it's time for Israel to cross the Jordan River, the Jordan is flooding, overflowing its banks. It's a raging river. But it's not until the priests step foot into the river that they hit dry ground. They they have to actually put the soles of their feet into the river in order to, boom, hit dry ground. There it is. This this is to drive home this point. Martin Luther King Jr. said that faith is taking the first step even when you can't see the whole staircase. See, if we walk with Jesus, we have to put our feet someplace new. And Joshua learns here the lesson of faith. Walk in faith. And then the cycle comes full circle all the way back around. And then there's more grace. Well, my gosh, he says, we see the waters part. We see God is the one who saves and secures us. More grace because we stepped out in faith. That faith is rewarded and now we see God's faithfulness with fresh eyes. The Lord your God, verse 9 says, is with you wherever you go. And of course, now they know it like they'd never known it before. So this is the cycle. God is growing Joshua. In grace, he's transforming a youth into a man. He's transforming an assistant to a man into a servant of the Lord through the desert cardio. Now, when I first discovered this text, I was somewhere in this cycle myself. As I said, I was a sophomore in college, and one day I came back from class and I came into my dorm room, and my Bible was open on my desk. 
And you're probably thinking my Bible was always open on my desk, but it, you did not know me back then. It, this was a surprise. I had not actually opened my Bible and left it on my desk. And I, I thought this would be even more shocking if my roommate had suddenly taken an interest in this book. I had to hide my Bible, but, he, but I doubt he did this. So I thought, well, this is a puzzle. This is kind of the strangest sort of break-in I've ever experienced. Someone has broken into my room and opened my Bible and left it on my desk, what's going on? I looked at it more closely and there was a, a sheet of uh, notebook paper that had been torn out of a notebook and it was covering half of the Bible and it had a hole in it so that you could only read one verse. Now I was on the edge of my own wilderness in that moment. I told you earlier I'd had five surgeries Somewhere between the meds and the rehab, I was hitting bottom. I, I can remember coming back from the boathouse long after the cafeteria had closed, hungry and exhausted, and just lying on the floor of my dorm room, looking up at the ceiling with tears of exhaustion in my eyes, thinking my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. My uh, high, sp high school yearbook quote was this, if it feels good, do it. If it doesn't, do it until it does. That may give you a little insight into my past. And it's, you know, great for rowers, but uh, it wasn't working for me in that moment. I mean, that was the story that I was living with. If you look at the medical papers coming out of that time, the physicians called what I had overuse syndrome and, quote, repetitive stress disorder. I had overworked myself to try to achieve some level that I thought was expected or that desired of me as a rower. You know, I knew nothing about grace at this time. And I was just devastated by crisis. And the only word I could find for myself was a word from the culture or the word of my fears or the word of my own disordered desires. And yet here in this moment, as I saw this book open on my desk, it was a season in my life in which there was a promise of a new way to walk. I had a friend named Todd, who was also on the crew. He was also from California. And Todd invited me into a small group. It's like our immersed groups. He says, would you be willing to read the Bible with some of the other rowers on the crew? And I, of course, said, no, I'm not a religious guy, um, which wasn't entirely true. I was praying, apparently, on my dorm room floor. But I didn't want to be seen as a religious guy. And so I said no, not wanting to out myself for over a year until one day I finally relented and I said, okay. And I joined this small group. And there it was, reading the Bible with a group of guys like myself. And it was, I, I, don't, I struggle to find words to describe this to you, but it's like Jesus, the, the living Jesus, stepped out of the book and into my life. Uh, it was a season of great transition in my life as Jesus challenged the narratives that were below the surface and called me into a better story into his story. One day, uh, I, 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 when I came in, I found this book, Bible on my desk. I, 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 like something clicked. I go, oh, I think I know what happened because earlier in that week, this was like a Thursday or Friday, earlier in that week, I'd been at this small group and we had been sharing prayer requests with one another and I had shared with this group that I was going away this coming weekend because I'd been invited by a young woman to... A, a, a campus carnival. It was a weekend carnival. And, and she was uh, this attractive young woman and she had invited me to spend a weekend uh, with her at a carnival. And she made sure I understood what this was gonna be out. She said, my roommates are all sleeping somewhere else. And I was terrified. Not of her, I was terrified of myself. I knew how easy it would be for me to fall back into my past. And so I'd said to my brothers in this group, would you please pray for me? And, and, and it must have been Todd, I immediately realized, who had broken somehow into my dorm room, put my Bible on the desk, and he had covered everything except for one verse, and it was verse 8 of Joshua chapter 1. And here's the words that I read that day as I thought about packing my bags to go to this other college. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall be successful. And I just laughed and my heart started to sing. 
I thought, oh my gosh, I have a father who loves me. I have a brother who has redeemed me. I am filled with the Holy Spirit of Jesus who brings resurrection power in and through me. I have a promise. There's a God who says, I am going to make your way. This was Jesus speaking his word, giving me a promise, calling me to faith. He's saying, walk with me and you will step into a new life. Now, looking back on, on that season, it was a couple of years of crisis. I, I wouldn't trade that crisis for any number of rowing medals, nor would I trade any other crisis at this point that I've had to struggle through because each one in its own way has taught me how to lift my heart up to the Lord. My faith has grown as I've gotten to know Jesus better. My faith, which is like precious gold, Peter says, refined by fire. And I want the same for you. If you and I could sit down for a cup of coffee and talk about our struggles together, I'd be thinking somewhere in the back of my mind about the, the desert cardio. And we really do need to help each other with this in the way that Todd helped me, or I believe Moses helped Joshua. So I want to give you today a set of diagnostic questions, just four questions. And I encourage you to write these down. Uh, maybe the quickest way to get them is to pull out your smartphone or start to take a picture of the screen and just capture them. You can write them down somewhere else later. But I'm gonna give you four diagnostic questions to help you kind of work through the desert cardio. And the first is the grace question. It's what, who does Jesus say I am? Remember Joshua, He's got to get a heart level grasp on the meaning of his name. The Lord saves. He, under, he needs to really understand he is saved and rescued, not by his own works, but by grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should boast. Joshua, the Lord is salvation. We have to understand ourselves to be saved by grace, secured by grace. And so who does Jesus say I am? Remember Calvin said the only way to know yourself is to know God. And the only way to know God is to know yourself. What is my God-given identity in this situation? You're thinking about your current moment. Who am I in this situation? Who does Jesus say that I am? Grace. The, the second question is about crisis. What do my reactions to this crisis tell me about my true beliefs? What do my reactions say about my two beliefs? Remember Joseph's, Joshua's Christ, Moses is dead. And our crisis might involve death or it might be you know, a rejection letter that you receive or a car accident that you've had or a breakup or any number of things. Don't, don't ask yourself so much what's happening, but what do I believe about what's happening? You're starting to get below the surface. What do my reactions say about my true beliefs? Not what I say I believe, but what I might actually believe because of the way I'm reacting. So get, get below the surface. Ask, what are my fears? What feels threatened here? What's not working here? Where might my des desires be disordered? We're trying to get at the deep narrative or the implicit narratives of our, our lives. And these narratives are shaped by our past, by our culture, by our sinful hearts, by the enemy himself, the father of lies. And those things, they will shape our responses unless we're aware of them. So we're trying to surface, take advantage of the crisis to surface those narratives. Number three, word. Where am I in God's story? Joshua is, is learning to receive a better story. This book of law shall not depart from your mouth. Remember, God's story is a drama in three acts, creation, fall, redemption, completion. Where are you in that story in this moment with this crisis? When we talk about the gospel here, we say this is the good news that God has reconciled the world to himself in Jesus Christ. That's, that's God's story. Followers of Jesus understand that that story is meant to reframe their current situation or crisis. That's why Jesus, speaking of a new exodus that he would represent for all people in John chapter 8, 31 and 32 says, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Where am I in God's story? For faith, what Bible promise opens me to a new way? Okay. 
Joshua needs to put his foot on a specific problem, promise, the sole of your foot. So ask the Lord to give you a specific promise to claim, a verse in the Bible, something that will change the trajectory of your situation as you move through it. You'll have to be reading the Bible regularly or gathering in an immersive group or a small group. And sometimes you might have to ask another person to speak a word into your life. But once you get that verse, write it down. This is what post-its are for, sharpies are for, tattoos are for. Keep it in, keep it in front of you, okay? Remember James 1.22 says, be doers of the word and not merely hearers. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.7 7, said, we walk by faith, not by sight. What is your faith in? What's the promise you're trusting in this season of crisis? What Bible promise opens me to a new way? So that's a desert cardio. It's kind of a tool for us, right? Stand in grace, face a crisis, hear the word, walk in faith, stand in grace. That's the practice. That's what we're trying to do when we lift our hearts up to the Lord. This is how we step into a new life. And finally, I just want to say, I believe this is a moment of great promise in your life. I believe there's a big yellow sign in front of you somewhere that, that says, caution, bright future ahead. For you, I know things are hard right now. I mean, we're like Joshua. We are weary. We've lost people. We're isolated. Our families are divided. It feels like we've lost two years of our lives. Churches are emptied. And when they're not, everything feels like it's changed. Someone, a friend of mine said to me the other day, hey, where's Mr. Positive? <laughs> I, and my first thought was, well, COVID positive. I think I lost him six months ago. <laughs> Trying to find, if you see Mr. Positive walk around here, let me know, because I've lost him. But here's what we're finding, better than that, we're finding new life in Jesus Christ. That's why we're in the wilderness, to find new life in Jesus Christ. When you walk with Jesus, you step into a new life. We can't go back to the past. You do know that, don't you? We cannot go back to the past. The only way out of this is forward, to step past the past into a new and better future. Moses is dead. We're not going back to 2019. We can't. This is true for you. This is true for me personally. It's true for us corporately. Moses is dead. Quit hanging around the tomb. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Christ is risen. Jesus goes before you. Look ahead. Follow Jesus. Claim a promise. Take a new step. You may not see the staircase until you take the first step. Be strong and courageous. Every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you as I promised to Moses. What a promise. Are you ready to walk? Are you ready to pick up your pallet and walk? Jesus is calling. Come, tax collector. Come, prostitute. Come, Pharisee. Come, leper. Come to me, he says. Walk with me and work with me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Be strong and courageous. Come place the sole of your foot on new ground. What a promise. Oh, what a promising church you are. Let's pray. God, no matter where we are in the wilderness, no matter how old or how young we are, we are people of a promise. Thank you for the invitation, even the challenge, the admonition to claim that promise and fully live into it. We confess we don't know how to do that. Uh, we are not adequate in ourselves, but we will also confess our, confess our faith and that we are, our adequacy comes not from ourselves, but from you. We invite you to pour out again a fresh measure of your Holy Spirit on each of us individually and all of us together corporately that we might embody and demonstrate the beauty of your kingdom for the coming age in our own day as we step into a new way of being. In Christ's name we pray, amen.